أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد Ahbab Mustafa alayhi salatu wasalam, we continue with our reflections on the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam as was narrated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Yusuf. And if I recall correctly, we missed each other last week because of the weather conditions. But the week before that, we were speaking about how the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam they took their little brother away from home and they told their father that they're going to go and play and have a good time. Meanwhile, they had a plan to dump him into a well and leave him there. And that is exactly what they did. And in ayah number 16, I remember this is where we stopped. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they came to their father at the time of Isha meaning these are the older brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, they came home in the evening and they were crying. They said, oh our father, we left Yusuf alayhi salam to look after our things and we went to play and a wolf ate him. And then they said, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُؤْمِنٍ لَنَا وَلَوْ كُنَّا صَادِقِينَ And they said, and we know that you will not believe us even if we were telling the truth. And this is something interesting, right? Something interesting because one of the things that we learn in life is what? You cannot hide the truth fully. Even if you lie, even if you lie, sometimes your own words will betray you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a way of, you know, allowing the truth to come out. And those people who want to deceive others will never be successful. And so the scholars of tafsir, they point out here, they say that from the words of the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, it was confirmed to their father, Sayyidina Ya'qub, that they lied. Right? Why is that? Imagine if I came and told you a story and I suspected that maybe you believe it, maybe you don't believe it. What would I say? If I want to plead my case, I would say, trust me, I'm telling the truth. Or please believe me, I'm telling the truth. But nobody in their right mind comes and says, I know that you will not believe me even if I was telling the truth. And you just admitted that you are not telling the truth. But even if you were telling the truth, still the other person shouldn't believe you. I hope you guys can see the... You know, difference between the choice of words here. So they acknowledged indirectly and obviously unintentionally to their father that in this moment we're not telling the truth. Because even if we're telling the truth, you may have trouble believing us. And so the scholars, they teach us from this the takeaway that, you know, it's not natural for the human to lie. So the brain may want to lie. And this is why, by the way, even people who lie, may Allah protect us, sometimes there's different kinds of people. There's people who are very good at lying, they are well trained, they have lots of experience lying, so they're good at it. But regular people like me and you, it's not natural to lie. And so this is why, like, let, let me give you an example, children. All children at some point in their life lie. It's a learning curve that kids go through. But kids are not used to lying. The nature of the kid is to tell the truth. That's why as a parent, you can figure out when your kid is lying. Because when your kid is lying, their face might become red. They might look down at the floor. They might stutter. They might play with their fingers. There are certain things that are not normal that the child does when he or she is lying. Right? But subhanAllah, as I said, may Allah protect us. There are some people who are older. And they are habitual liars, professional liars, right? They are very good at it to the extent nobody can notice that they are lying. This is obviously a sickness and they need help. But these brothers of Yusuf, unfortunately, they lied to their father. And Allah says, وَجَاءُوا عَلَىٰ قَمِيسِهِ بِدَمٍ كَذِبٍ 
and see the balagha of the Quran, Allah says that they brought the shirt that had lying blood on it. Blood doesn't lie, right? The blood cannot tell the truth, the blood cannot lie. But Allah says that the shirt they brought had the blood that was lying on it. They are lying and the blood is meant to lie also. Meaning what? That this is a trick that they were putting together, which is that the shirt of Yusuf a.s. it had blood on it. The father said, بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا There is something that you guys are working on here together. Something you guys have put together among yourselves here. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ So he promised and he committed to having sabr jameel, beautiful patience. And he said, وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ My complaint is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Assalamu alaikum. Is this the guest? This is not who we were expecting. Brother Robbie, this is an inside joke. You are too late to the party. May Allah bless you. Good to see you. Um, so let's break this down a little bit. The father of Yusuf alayhi salam said, Na Yaqub, and I want you to imagine, to put yourself in his shoes for one second. May Allah protect us from ever having to experience something like this. But what would you do? You are a father. On one hand, you have sons who are your sons, they're your children. On the other hand, you have another son, he's your child. You figure out that something fishy is going on here. Something messed up happened. These sons of yours are claiming that their brother is dead. They're blaming it on a wolf and they brought the shirt to show you the proof. You know most likely this is baloney. What are you going to do? What can you do? You know, it's completely different if you find out some stranger killed your son. Everybody knows what they will do next. But this is your own children and the struggle is among them. You are the father. You have to have some wisdom. You need to deal with the situation in a wise way. What would you do? And so Yusuf salam's father, Sayyidina Yaqub salam, he gives us a hint and he says that he will have sabrun jameel. What is sabrun jameel? What is beautiful patience? This ibarah of sabrun jameel comes a couple of times in the Quran. Okay? What is sabr jameel? What does it mean to have beautiful patience? To have beautiful patience, you know, patience is something that is prescribed upon us as believers. Let's start from the bottom. What is patience? Patience or sabr is a concept that is exemplified and embodied in the Muslim. Ulama of Islam, they teach us that there is three types of sabr that the Muslim has to have. How many types of sabr? Three, right? The three types of sabr are as follows. Number one, there is sabr al taha You need to be patient to continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's give an example. To pray Salatul Fajr in the morning, you need sabr. You need some, you know, determination and some ongoing act of sabr in the winter time over here to wake up, remove your blanket, go make wudu, freshen up, pray salah, and then decide what to do next. And to do this every single day, the rest of your life will require sabr. And the same goes for everything else. Any obedience of Allah, it needs sabr. Ulama al-Islam say the second type of sabr is the sabr to avoid the ma'asi, the sabr to avoid the sins and the things that displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is something that will bring the displeasure of Allah. You need to have patience and avoid it, right? Persevere. Sabr to avoid the things that are haram. And the third type of sabr, ulama al-Islam will tell us, is the sabr that, which is the one maybe many of us can think of, that is the sabr with the decree of Allah, with the qadr of Allah. Allah has decreed something, it may be a test for us, it may be difficult for us, but we have to have sabr. So this is the foundation of the concept of sabr in Islam. Now Sayyidina Yaqub is introducing another concept, that is sabr jameel, the most beautiful form of patience. What is the most beautiful form of patience? The ulama of Islam, they define this for us and they say, that sabr jameel is to be patient without complaining. This is the key. Right? 
to be patient without complaining. And that's why Sayyidina Yaqub what did he say? He said, my complaint is to Allah. I'm not going to complain to anybody else. I'm not going to find any human being to complain about my situation to. I will complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this difficult situation that I am in. And while I complain to Allah, I will continue to have patience. By the way, complaining to Allah is praiseworthy. Complaining to the creation of Allah is blameworthy. What do I mean by that? Self-explanatory. It's not recommended to complain to other people, but it is recommended to complain to Allah. Make dua and complain to Allah about your problems. Present your needs to Him. Explain your situation to Him. This is commendable. And this is inshallah rewardable. And Allah loves it. And He will help you. But don't be of the people who complain to other people about your problems. News flash, you know, hardly anybody cares, nor can many people really help you. Let's give real life examples so we understand what sabr jameel looks like and what it doesn't look like. You see, in our lingo, in our conversations, I think I've mentioned this here before in the masjid, sabr is something that we all know is good. Every Muslim knows that sabr is good. But what do we do? And I'm not picking on anybody here. It can go either way. It can be the husband complaining about the wife, or the wife complaining about the husband, or the parents, the husband and wife complaining about the children. So the mother, let's start with the mother. The mother, as an example, calls her friend to complain about her daughter, let's say. And what does she say? Half an hour complaining. She is like this, and she is like that, and she is like this, and she is like that, and you won't believe what she said, you won't believe what she did, and you can't even imagine what she doesn't do. And after half an hour of complaining, in the end, what does she say? She says, ah, oh, but what can we do? We have to have sabr. We have to have sabr. There's no other choice. And we insert that line at the end of our complaints to almost make ourselves feel good, to think we are religious, we're Islamic, we're following the command of Allah. Ya Habibi, okay. after one hour of complaining, now you want to have sabr? What's going on? And the same can be said, as I said, adult to adult. The brother, you know, is complaining to his friend or whatever about his wife. She is like this and she is like that. And she told me like this. And she doesn't cook enough food. And she doesn't do this and she doesn't do that. The whole rap sheet. And at the end, but brother, you know, what can we do? After all, she's my wife. We have to have sabr. Huh? What to do? And I, like I said, the problem is the where the issue that I have is that the people think that this is being religious and they think this is what it means to have sabr but this maybe, maybe, maybe it's sabr because maybe all you do is complain but you don't act on anything you just complain and then in the end you have sabr, maybe but this is not the sabr jameel that Allah prescribes in the Quran this is not the sabr jameel that Yaqub practiced sabr jameel that Yaqub practiced is I have a big problem and I'm not going to complain to anybody about it. I complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taban, when we say this, obviously, we need to clarify things. I'm not suggesting that if you need help, don't ask help, right? So, Masalan, as an example, the you know, sister at home is in an abusive household. Then she says, the Imam said, don't complain to anyone. Sabrun jameel. Then endure the abuse. No, haram. Go and seek help. Call the police. Tell your sister that she can seek help in the community. Whatever it might be. Seek help. If you need help, seek help. But complaining, see the problem, and this let me be clear here. The problem with the guys who are complaining on the phone is they're not expecting help. You know and I know when we are expecting help versus when we are just venting and ranting. And venting and ranting is not something praiseworthy in Islam. Just to talk for the sake of talking, to complain for the sake of complaining, it's not a good quality, it's not healthy, right? It's not something that should be from the mannerism of the Muslim. On the other hand, the Muslim, if we complain and we talk to others, it's solution-oriented. It's to fix the problem, it's to find a way. And if there is no other option, like Ya'qub salam, this is what I believe was his condition, he said, okay, who is going to be able to give me advice in this situation? Like, maybe there's nobody else in the dunya who's going through what I'm going through. I have some sons who are claiming that the other son died. And I know that these sons are responsible for it. 
and I don't know where the other son is. I haven't seen him, nor have I heard from him. I don't know if anybody else is facing this in this dunya. Who will be able to give me practical advice to figure out what to do next? Then there's no point complaining to anybody. I complain to Allah and I ask Allah for His help. There is also one last thing before we move on that is worth mentioning. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ on one occasion, and this is very challenging, but to share with you the story and we can learn the lesson. On one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ, he passed the graveyard of Medina and he found a lady who was crying and screaming and she was having a very rough time at the sight of a grave. And the Prophet ﷺ, he knew that this lady, her son had died. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he went behind her and he said, you know, my sister, be patient. Be patient with the decree of Allah. May Allah, you know, reward you and compensate you in a way that is good for you. And she told the Prophet ﷺ, she said, get lost. You don't know what I'm going through. If you were going through what I was going through, you'll be crying even more than I'm crying. You don't know anything. And she told him to get away. And so the Prophet ﷺ is amazing, right? The Prophet ﷺ quietly turned around and walked away. Some other people that were at the cemetery, they went there and they said, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? That was the messenger of Allah talking to you. And that's what you told him. She said, oh, I didn't recognize him. I didn't know it was him. I thought it was some other random guy. And you know, he didn't understand my condition. So she went to visit the Prophet ﷺ at his house. And she called for him and he came ﷺ. And she said, you know, I'm so sorry, I didn't recognize you earlier. Thank you for your advice. I am ready to be patient now. And the Prophet ﷺ, he taught her and he taught all of us something important. He said, As-sabru and the sadmat al-ula. The patience, the real patience, is at the time of the calamity. Not after you ran out of tears and your voice is gone and you have nothing else to yell and shout about. Now you say, khalas, now it's time to settle down and we have patience. The real patience is in the moment of the calamity. Whether that's loss of money, loss of a family member, loss of opportunity, you know, somebody else offends you, harms you. Real patience is in that moment, right? Myself first and all of it. Let's give a real example that maybe many of us can relate to. Road rage, right? When you are driving on the road and somebody, whether you are the road rager or the victim of the road rage, either way, if you are driving on the road and someone does something really bad, they cut you off or whatever, how do we react? Do we have patience, right? Or is the first thing that happens that we bang on our steering wheel, speak all kinds of colorful language, yell and scream, um, and then after that, once the blood pressure has settled, ah, alhamdulillah, now we have to have supper, right? So these are real life examples that we can think about and you know, take some inspiration from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and the words of Allah in the Qur'an. Patience is not to complain and real patience is in the moment at the time of the calamity or at the time of the trial. Let's move on. Allah says, وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَهُ قَالَ يَا بُشْرَى هَذَا هُلَامٌ وَأَسَرُّوهُ بِضَاعَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah says, you know, later on, a car or whatever it was passed by. Sayyara today in Arabic would say car, right? Allah here is talking about Sayyara at that time. So maybe a horse with the cart or whatever it was. Sayyara came and figured out when they were trying to draw water from the well that there is a boy in there. So the guy who was drawing the water, he yelled out. He said, I have good news. There is a hulam here. And he obviously meant and understood that this is a child or a young boy that he can sell in the slave market, meaning this is good money. We came looking for water, we found gold, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they were happy that they found this boy that they could sell and they could make some money off of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالشَّرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودًا they found the boy. I made this point two weeks ago when we were here in the masjid and I'm going to reiterate it again. And you will see this happening throughout the surah of Yusuf. Allah says they found the boy. 
immediately after the next thing Allah says is they sold him. Obviously lots happened in between. They found the boy, they had to pull him out, they had to check who he is, where did he come from, ask him where his family is, figure out he doesn't know, then load him onto the cart, tie his hands, tell him we're going to take you and sell you, don't worry, we'll find a good family for you. The boy is scared, he's worried, where am I going to go, where am I going to end up? They ride till they get to the next city, you know, after the well. Over there they find the market. In the market they go and they set up their shop and they say we have, you know, a good young boy, healthy boy who we're selling. If anybody wants to take him and use him in their home as a slave, he's here for you, he can do work for you. Da -da -da -da. Lots of things happen. Everything that I just explained, none of it is mentioned in the Quran. Right? And the question is why? And how come? All of this is here. You need to understand and connect the dots. And that's why I said two weeks ago that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this Quran for people who are awake. You cannot be on cruise control. You cannot be snoozing while trying to understand Quran. Because Allah tells you what is most important for you to know. Allah tells you things that there's a lesson in it for you to learn. And the stuff in between, Allah is trusting that this aql that He gave us should be utilized to connect the dots. Right? And this is why Surah Yusuf is one thing, and the story of Prophet Yusuf that we get out from Surah Yusuf is something else. Because a lot of the pieces and a lot of the dots we will fill in ourselves as understanding. It's not rocket science, right? I'm just using this as one example. All of you probably understood everything that I explained as being, you know, natural. But this is one good example that there are other places in the Quran where if you are not awake enough, shukran, jazakallah khairan, Allah bless you and your family. If you are not awake enough and you are not listening, if you're not listening attentively, and if you're not intelligent enough, you might get lost while trying to understand the Quran. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this for a number of reasons because some of the finer details are not beneficial for us. And if Allah included all the details in the Quran, it will be 10 volumes. This is one thing. Second thing is, Allah, you, Allah really wants, Allah's goal is that we use this guy. Right? Allah's goal is not that we put this on autopilot. This should be working. And it should be used as we read and understand the Quran and develop an appreciation for the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyhow, so what does this ayah mean? Allah says in ayah number 20 that they sold Yusuf alayhi salam uh, for a very, you know, almost worthless price. Darahim ma'duda. You know, dirhams that you can count. A handful of coins is what they sold him for. They didn't really need him. They had no use for him. That's why they sold him for such a cheap price. Here, um, you know, there's two ways of understanding this. On one hand, we could understand it literally that they sold him for a very cheap price because they just wanted to get rid of him and they didn't know what to do with him. Another way of looking at it, some of the Mufassirun pointed out that they didn't understand and they could have never known. How would they have known what the value of this boy is? Right? This boy is going to grow up to be a prophet of Allah. He's going to grow up to be the minister of finance of Egypt. He's a very valuable human, but they didn't know. And that's why Bithaman and Bakhs, like any cost that they could have came up with for him would have been insignificant. And eventually it was just for a few coins. But whatever price they estimated for Yusuf Islam, they didn't really know what value he would be to humanity in the future. And that's why whatever price they got for him was rather insignificant. So obviously somebody ends up buying him. وَقَالَ الَّذِي اشْتَرَاهُ مِنْ مِصْرَ نِمْرَأَتِهِ أَكْرِمِي مَثْوَاهِ The one who bought him was from Egypt. How many countries are mentioned in the Qur'an, guys? Canada? How many? Saudi? Where's our Saudi brother? He'll be so happy. Huh? Sham? No? Egypt for sure? Yemen? No. 
Habashana. Indonesia, wallah, I'm still looking for that one. I didn't find it yet. <clears throat> no? Rome? That, that's a good one. I never thought of that. Or never factored that. But yes, Rome is mentioned in the Quran, but Rome is a city. Iraq? There's only one country mentioned in the Quran, guys. That's Egypt. Egypt is the only country mentioned in the Quran by name. Sa Saudi Arabia, just as an idea, just for us to appreciate. The country of Saudi Arabia was invented how many years ago? 100 and 120, 150 years ago? MashaAllah, Ahsad, you're the best. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is this is different. I'm talking about countries, right? Which city? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mecca, Mecca is mentioned in the Quran. Even Mecca, not by the name Mecca. Mecca is mentioned. Umm al Qura is mentioned as a name for the city of Mecca. Medina is mentioned as a in its linguistic form, not the city of Medina. So Allah talks about وَدَخَلَ الْمَدِينَةَ عَلَىٰ حِينِ غَفْلَةِ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Like they entered into a city. It's any city, like the city that Allah is talking about. Um, other geographical areas are mentioned in the Qur'an. There's no doubt about it. Uh, now? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Many other locations are mentioned. Um, but country by name, as we know it as a country with a name, is only uh, Egypt. Right, which Allah mentions in the Quran, which is here. By the way, the Masriyin are very proud of this, right? Because his ayah in the Quran, they love it so much. Because what did Allah say? It comes in Surah Yusuf, we'll study together. Misra insha'Allahu aminin. Right? Enter into Egypt, you will be safe, insha'Allah. The Egyptians love this is their favorite ayah in the Quran for obvious reasons, right? They have it everywhere, right? Masha'Allah. Um, like enter Egypt, you will be safe. It's an ayah in the Quran. Is it true? I never went. So we'll see. <laughs> Today, unfortunately, all of this stuff is relevant. It's, it's here, and reality is a very different, uh, very different situation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but then Musa alayhi salam took them out. Then, then they regained their freedom. Yeah. No. Taib. So Allah says that the people from Egypt bought them. And the Egyptian man who bought Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, he said to his wife, Akrimi mathwa, treat him nicely. Asa ayyanfa'ana aw nattakhidahu walada. It's either he will be of benefit to us. Or maybe we can adopt him as our son. So it seems this man in Egypt who bought him was a nice guy. He said, treat him well. Maybe he will help us in the future. And if not, we can adopt him. He can be our son. Either way, you know, it's win-win. Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلِنُعَلِّمَهُ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ Allah says, like this or like that, we established Yusuf on earth, meaning we gave him power on earth. This is how we did it. And we taught him the interpretation of dreams. Wallahu ghalibun ala amri. Allah is. How do you translate and explain that Allah is ghalib ala amri? Allah is ghalib. Allah is a victorious or he is overpowering over anyone else and anything else. Allah is above everything. The plan of Allah, the help of Allah is above any other coalition, any other plan, any other plot, any other might. Any strength that can be organized, any plan that can be enacted, the plan of Allah is more powerful than that. That's literally what 
the meaning of Allah is ghalib. That's what it means. Allah says, Wallahu ghalibun ala amrih. Allah is ghalib. He's overpowering over everything. The only problem is, walakinna akthara nasi la But most people don't know that. So most people are plotting and scheming and trying. But they don't know that Allah is more powerful than all of them. And here is another very good example of how Allah jumps to you know, a different time period in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. Allah says, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجِزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ When Yusuf alayhi salam became mature and he was a young man, we gifted him with wisdom and knowledge. And like that, we compensate and we reward the people of Ihsan, the people who have excellence, those who are among the muhsineen. Two, two or three things here and then we conclude. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that I want you to appreciate here. Allah says an Egyptian man bought Yusuf as a slave. The Egyptian man told his wife, be nice to him. Maybe he will become our adopted son or he will help us in the future. Then Allah comments and he says, this is how we established and gave Yusuf power in the land. And Allah has power over everything and he is above everyone. But most people don't know. What is happening here? Can anyone imagine or would anyone have thought that the process of being sold into slavery is the necessary transition to Yusuf السلام, becoming successful and powerful? At home, Yusuf السلام, was a nobody. With all due respect, he was a young boy. His brothers didn't like him. They wanted to kill him. Their act of dumping him in a well so that he can be picked up as a slave and sold as a slave to somebody in Egypt resulted in an opportunity for him to work in the government of Egypt. And that is why Allah says that through this transition of becoming a slave, this is actually how Allah willed that Yusuf will become a man of power. And Allah is on top of everything. Allah is above every plan, but people don't know. See, the brothers of Yusuf were planning that this act of theirs will finish Yusuf will humiliate him and will maybe end his life even. They didn't realize that this very act of theirs of dumping him in a well is what will propel Yusuf to the height of human civilization. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when Yusuf became a young man, he gifted him with knowledge and wisdom. These are two qualities that are, you know, very, very, very valuable and treasurable in a human being. A good leader or a good human being doesn't only have knowledge. They need knowledge and wisdom, right? These things go together. You can know lots of things. If you don't know how to use it, it's of no benefit. So it's not only the knowledge that you want. You want the knowledge and the wisdom. In our language today, what do we say? We say knowledge and experience. Experience is wisdom. In any career, in any workplace, what is valuable? There I say what is more valuable than your knowledge, your experience. You don't have to know everything, but if you have a lot of experience, you're a valuable asset to an establishment, to a company, to a corporation. Why? Because in Arabic, what do we say? What is the definition of hikmah or wisdom? It's to put things in their right places. To know where to place things. So hikmah is to say the right thing at the right time, in the right place, in the right manner. This quality of knowing when to do things and how to do things and how to act and you know, having wisdom is extremely valuable. And it's the difference maker between good and great people, right? Because all people, especially in the world today, alhamdulillah, we live in the age of information, everybody's educated. Everybody knows a thing or two. But what separates good people from great people is the wisdom that they have and their ability to, you know, do the right thing at the right time in the right place in the right way. So Allah gave Yusuf السلام, the hikmah and the knowledge, the experience and the knowledge, the wisdom and the knowledge. And Allah says, this is how we reward the people of Ihsan. This is how we reward the people of excellence. We're going to stop here today, inshallah. 
we covered quite a bit, alhamdulillah. We'll continue next week, bin Allah ta'ala. No, we will not continue next week. Next week is going to be family night. And the topic for next week is reflecting on Al Isra wal Mi'raj, the journey of the Prophet. And more than likely, just to share with you guys, give you some insight. More than likely, I will be talking about how me and you can have our own journey of Al Mi'raj with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I'll be selling tickets. No, I'm joking. There's no ticket to go on Mi'raj. It's not like Hajj. Although I could charge you 10,000 and then figure out what to do next. No, the journey of Mi'raj for me and you, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he explains that each and every single one of us has the opportunity to meet Allah. How do we meet Allah? Through our salah. Right? This is a different, completely different concept. You and I have the opportunity to meet with Allah five times a day. And that opportunity is inside of the salah that we perform. The Prophet ﷺ made the journey, body and soul, through the heavens till he met with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gave him the gift of salah that he gave to you and I so that we can meet with Allah regularly every day. This is the theme of you know what we will be reflecting on next week inshallah. More than likely, uh, things can change, but this is what I'm planning to discuss next week. And as usual, the family night is packed with all kinds of fun and surprises. And uh, we'll have a lovely potluck dinner together inshallah. So those of you who are joining online, may Allah bless all of you. I hope to see you guys next week, inshallah. Bring the family, come and enjoy. We'll have a wonderful evening together. That's next weekend, Saturday evening, starting at 6 p.m. Inshallah, the uh, halaqa will be after Isha, as usual, after 7. But we come here at 6 to enjoy dinner together. We hope to see you all next week. For those of us who are here in the masjid, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us home safely. And may He reward us all for our efforts and grant us the best in this dunya. And may he open the doors of Jannah for all of us in the next life. Hada wallahu a'lam wa salli lahum wa sallim wa barik alayhi muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.